So let's see. Huh. Well, I thought I would start with something frivolous this morning because the first speech should sort of be frivolous. So about two weeks ago, um, I was travel. I, I travel a lot, and uh, I was in Mongolia for a month or so, uh, riding horses with Cossacks, and I went to this eagle hunter festival and I was riding near the Russian and Chinese border. And this has nothing to do with technology, but I just thought it would be entertaining. So the, um, the, the picture in the top left has a couple of eagle hunters I know, and I got to go eagle hunting, and that's me up in the top right um, going eagle hunting with them, which is really a cool thing. So if you ever get to do it, I, I strongly suggest that you do it. And this, these are some competitions they have at the festival. This is called Buskashi, where they take a dead goat and they cut the head off. I, I think it's in that order. And then they have like a tug of war on horseback, and they do it in a number of countries like Afghanistan. And you get to watch them, and it's really brutal. And they, they, they ride the horses up over cars and parking lots, and it's just, it's just really cool. And there's no technology at all. And, um, and then this thing down here on the bottom right was my favorite. And this is a, a Mongolian Kazakh uh, competition called uh, Man and Woman Horse Race. So what it is is they dress in ceremonial Kazakh clothing and they race a two kilometer race, except during the race, and they're always couples, and during the race, the woman is allowed to, to beat the shit out of her husband with a horse whip. <laughs> <clears throat> and the, the goal is, is to, to basically stop her husband from getting to the finish line or at least just take out an enormous amount of pent up frustration um, and it was, uh, it's everybody's favorite competition. So, and I'll, one more story and then I'll start talking about technology, although this is a bit of technology. So I was fortunate enough to have an audience with this gentleman who's the head llama of Mongolia. And it, this was an Ulaanbaatar. And he's, a, the, uh, I guess he's the son of the uh, eighth or ninth in reincarnation of the um, um, what do they call him, the Zan Bazaar of Mongolia, and he's an intimate of the Dalai Lama, a very holy guy, and I was in his chamber, and he was giving a lecture about Buddhist compassion, and uh, it was very interesting, and then he asked if anybody had any questions, and I've spent 35 years plus on information technology, and you know, it was one, something that concerned me, and I asked him, and I said, Your Holiness, I, everywhere I go in the world, I see people on cell phones, on tablets, and they're more concerned with what they're doing than with the people around them. And it seems they're disconnected from people. Is this run contrary to Buddhist compassion? And he said, that's a good question. And just then there's this ringing noise, right? So, and I took a picture. He reaches in his robe, he pulls out a phone. He starts talking in Tibetan on one phone, completely ignores me. Three minutes later, pulls out a galaxy and starts making calendar notes. So for 10 minutes, this, this guy, this llama, is like doing stuff that we would all do. He's calendaring, he's chatting, he's doing all this stuff. Ten minutes later, he puts both phones, tucks them into his robe, and he says, I'm sorry, you were asking a question. I've completely forgotten what it was. What was it? So this is why you travel, because you can't, you know, you can't make stuff like this up. So now... Talking about technology, I, I was CTO of Network Solutions during uh, the late 90s and the early 00s. So I, uh, I was the representative of the internet uh, on President Clinton's Y2K committee and a number of other things. And I architected the modern uh, DNS registration system and helped create uh, ICANN, unfortunately. And the, I had some observations. And the reason I'm going to mention some of these, and then I'll finish up with some kind of blue sky sort of crazy things about blockchain and you can make what you want out of them. Um, these are observations that I saw during the dot-com bubble and I think they're related to blockchain in some ways or you may think that. So one is, is when you have a true bubble or a, a very strong technology wave that changes business and culture, you see a lot of flailing and disruption. And the first thing we saw was just an absolute ton of lawsuits, just crazy, crazy lawsuits. So I, I was uh, a representative in 98 lawsuits in three years, uh, and major companies, you know, um, Lockheed and 
Hasbro. And, and these were over, over domain names. And I put some of them up here. It was like PETA was the first uh, intellectual property lawsuit for internet-related stuff over a domain name. And the reason was because some guy bought PETA.com. PETA, of course, is n normally believed to be people for the ethical treatment of um, animals, but somebody bought it and put up a website called People Who Eat Tasty Animals and put up a bunch of things about meat, like sausage and schnitzel, and, and the PETA people weren't amused at all, and they sued, and it was like a big, big lawsuit. Um, the Candyland uh, became, was bought by a porn site. Skunk Works was a big Lockheed lawsuit. And MTV was, uh, there was one of the original VJs was a guy named Adam Curry, if anybody remembers him. And he bought, ah, there you go. And he bought uh, MTV.com in 1984 for whatever, it was like five bucks or something. And he asked MTV if they wanted it. They said, why would we want this internet thing? You keep it. So three years later, they completely changed their mind and they wanted it back again and they couldn't have it. And they sued Adam Curry who sold it for like a, a lot of money. Same story with McDonald's.com. Nobody wanted it in 94, 95. Everybody wanted it in 97. So there was uh, this flailing. Um, there was greed and fear, and I'll talk about greed and fear a little bit more. The second thing I noticed was that marketing, uh, I'm not a huge marketing fan as a general uh, rule of thumb anyway, in the sense that uh, when you define marketing as being stimulation, I don't believe in that. I don't think you can stimulate demand. I think demand's either there or it isn't. I think marketing in, in this context was more about marketing communications. So when you're refining marketing, and this certainly was true during the dot-com stuff, it was about getting your message clear. It wasn't about causing people to want to buy something. And I think you'll see that with blockchain apps too. If you have to explain to somebody why they want to buy something, you're probably selling the wrong product in my opinion. In the dot-com world, I mean, I was in, in Network Solutions, I was the marketing guy for two years, and I was the CTO, and that's because we just didn't really need a marketing person. And by the time we needed somebody, it was, you know, we were selling so many domain names, it was ridiculous. Um, the third thing I noticed was about content, and again, I think this is applicable to blockchain. The content, it seemed, for anyone who remembers this, because it was 20 years ago, but content seemed to spring up very quickly on websites. And I believe the reason was because the content was already there. It had been created in the previous wave of technology. Uh, desktop publishing, people that had you know, home computers, they were building little things in database like you know, the top you know, 50 Debbie Gibson albums or something like that. And then, and then they were able to build a website and then let everybody see the stupid list they put. And, and what they were doing was disgorging the data from one technology form to another and that transition was what created the explosion. And I think we'll see something very similar in blockchain. So it's transformational, not creational. So when you see these kind of explosions, that's typically what happens. Um, and, and, you know, I'm using the word technology very loosely. Things, and I've seen maybe two other waves that if anybody wants to talk about, we can. Like, I mean, I've been doing this for a long time. These things aren't about technology. It's usually about engineering. Um, and you know, another thing within 18 months, and I'll talk a little bit more about this, there were so many idiotic venture-funded companies for so many incredibly stupid reasons that took advantage of this wave, um, and they were all doomed. Almost every single one of them died. Um, but the last point, which is kind of interesting, is during this flail of confusion and fear and everything else, uh, engineers were able to make uh, very interesting decisions about architecture. Um, and, and those decisions still stand today. The DNS was, was able to be uh, architected in ways that drove governance today and other things. And I think that's going on also with today with encryption, with blockchain, with other things. Little, little decisions can be made today that by the time that lawyers and governance people actually realize what's going on, six or seven years from now, it's going to be a fait accompli. So it's just something that you might want to think about. So just as a, you know, I don't know if it's going to go the same way, but just as a little rule of thumb here, somebody asked me last night about, you know, whether we're in the middle of a bubble in blockchain, whether it's going to blow up. I don't think it's even started yet. I mean, this is, again, this is the dot-com, um, the dot-com bubble over a, you know, 30-year period, but 
1985, which is only 32 years ago, there were six domain names. And uh, these were, there were a couple in the .NET uh, world, but th these were, you know, these were all thinking machines, Northrop Grumman, Symbolics was a Lisp computer company. And I got to the company in 1996, there were about 400,000 domain names. And by the time I left in late 2001, there were well over 20 million domain names. That, I mean, that's more than exponential. So the, the growth, when you, when you get to these, these kind of, you know, these bubbles, these, these technology surges, it's, it's astronomical. And they happen very, very fast. And you get to these pivot points where things just surge. And I, w I would anticipate something very similar in, in what you guys are, are going to go through very soon. Um, another take-home point, this is sort of depressing, but the technologists very rarely get rich in these things, has been my experience. The investors get very rich. The VCs get very rich. Um, uh, you know, one example, Mark Cuban, who got actually quite wealthy, but he was very lucky and he wasn't really a technologist anyway. But the, the people who, get, who make a lot of money, you know, they sell their company at the right time. Like Cuban sold Broadcast.com to Yahoo for five, six billion dollars worth of Yahoo stock, and Yahoo's a piece of crap company anyway, and always has been. But they, he sold it to them, he got their stock, he sold their stock, he bought sports teams, the sports teams did well, he became a TV star. He may end up president of the United States in three years, who knows? But, you know, it's a very bizarre road that he went on, but that's kind of how it happened. Most technologists I know in the first wave of the dot-com world actually ended up broke. Um, I had 300, 400 engineers working for me at one point. Um, on paper, most of them were millionaires at one point. By the end of the game, probably half of them owed the United States government money because of taxes. And um, I don't know if that... Whatever that means, I'll just point that out. But it was, they, they were given bad advice by accountants, and uh, they ended up owing, owing money because of capital gains treatment. So um, most VCs made money anyway, though, so good for the VCs. So just, you know, just as, a, as a thought, you know, when we're talking about bubbles, the, if you look at the market caps of the dot-com companies, you're looking at about a quarter trillion dollars of market cap, um, at least 200, 200 billion, depending on how you want to reckon it. One company alone, and I knew several of the executives in this company, Global Crossing, had a market cap of almost $50 billion. I mean, nobody, probably half the people or less even know what that company is today, and this wasn't even that long ago. Uh, Network Solutions, the company I was with, we were bought by uh, SAIC, which is a military contractor in the US, in 1996 for $3.1 million, and we sold to Verisign in 2001, five years later, four years later, for a uh, market, and the market cap was $21 billion. So I don't even know, I mean, I don't even know how many, what is that, three orders of magnitude, four orders of magnitude, something like that. It's, it's not uncommon in those periods to see those kind of valuations. Um, and all of these companies tanked. I mean, they all did. Um, you know, they go up, they go down. The investors make money, the technologists don't. But the companies that did do well in those periods were the companies that had business ideas. They didn't just have technology ideas. They built, they, they, were, they were MBAs. They were people who built business visions on top of the existing technology and large visions. Google staked out, there were many tech companies. Uh, I knew most of the search companies because that's what I did at the time. Uh, Alta Vista, Excite, uh, Inktomi, these were good companies and they're good technologists, all of them, and they all tanked because they, they were just wanted to do search. But Google came along and Google had a much bigger vision than search. And they hooked up with Eric Schmidt who had a lot of experience at Novell and Sun Microsystems. And they built a business model that was sustainable. And they, built, they had a vision about digital artifacts and management of digital artifacts. Amazon, I think everybody kind of knows where Amazon's headed today. I mean, it's pretty much ownership of the retail commerce world. PayPal, they, they, they had a, a series of M&A. They merged originally with Elon Musk's X.com, which was a banking company, uh, online banking company, and then uh, got bought by eBay, and they just kind of continued. And, and now they uh, have staked out this area. Apple reinvented themselves while Steve Jobs was still alive. And anyway, so second-generation second companies just basically reinvent their business model. 
Third wave social media, I, I have no, not a lot of use for. I mean, I, I do it. I don't think they're going to, I don't think it's sustainable. I don't think it's, I think, you know, I think Facebook's had their, their day in the sun, just like MySpace. Uh, I, my, this is my personal opinion, and I'll start giving a lot more of those. But, um, you know, I, Twitter, you know, I use it when I get drunk. And <laughs> <laughs> just like, like the president of the country that I belong to. And um, I, think, I think that the, the photo intensive and media intensive social media companies make sense to me uh, because they fit the hardware. So when the iPhone X comes out and the good galaxies and, you know, these, these phones and some of the social media things, uh, they, they fit the, when the hardware and the software make, fit together, it makes sense to me. But when they don't, it doesn't make sense. Facebook is becoming a grandparents thing. Oh, look at the picture of my grandchild. Um, it's, not a, it's not a millennial thing. It, it, it doesn't, not even, it's not even a baby boomer thing anymore. I, it just doesn't make sense. To me, the future is more like what I think the iPhone X is going to do with and emojis and, and things like that. And I think the other thing that, you know, and this is start giving out with the predictions here, but I think the other thing we're going to see a lot of is uh, what I'm, what I'm going to call tribal information circles, which we're already seeing where people use their own social, where instead of conventional media, they use their own social media circle to vet information. And in the US, we're already seeing this. And if you, because of this last election we had, if you talk to two or three people who voted differently in the election, if, if you actually talk to people who voted differently, you, you swear, and you look at the news, you swear to God that these are different news that you're talking about. I mean, the same news story, it, it, it's like two different news stories because their social circle is vetting the stories in a completely different way, and it, there's almost no congruence anymore. Um, and, and I think that, that pattern is replicating itself in much of the world, at least the Western world, uh, as opposed to places you know, where you have, like China, where, of course, you only have one news worth speaking of. So I think that's a lot more of the future. So my biggest takeaway from the dot-com bubble, um, it was about fear and it was about greed. The greed, the greed was consumer-driven. Uh, you see greed whenever people buy more of something than they can use on their own, conventionally known as hoarding. So if you buy a domain name and you put up a website, great, that makes sense. If you buy three domain names and you only put up one, you know, you're hoarding and that's greed. And there was a lot of that. I mean, those numbers I showed you a minute ago, 300 million domain names, there are not 300 million websites. That's pretty clear. And it's a lot of them is hoarding, and it's for blackmail purposes. And I, and I think we'll see more of that with, with new technology also. But the fear isn't, isn't f about people, and I'll, I'm going to talk more about this in a minute. The fear isn't consumer fear. The fear is institutional fear. So as the tech, these technologies develop, what it really does is it scares, it scares the crap out of governments and, and entrenched corporations, and that creates wonderful opportunity. Because when, when institutions get afraid, then I, I think it's a really great time to be building applications and invest. And I think one of the questions to ask yourself is how can blockchain applications scare institutions? Because historically, when you look at governments, I mean, the power of a government, you know, philosophically and historically is to interdict. So they interdict goods through customs. They interdict people through immigration. And that's how they, they do things. They collect taxes. They collect tariffs. They stop people at their borders. But the digital world came along, you know, 35 years ago, and it became a, tr a problem. And that's, the, I think, what the dot-com bubble fear was about. How do you interdict things now? How do you stop things? You know, how do you collect money for uh, sales tax on the internet when you want to collect tax? How do you stop people from saying things in China? Th I think those are the issues now, and it, it's eroding the power of governments and entrenched corporations, and that's fear. You know, how, so when the government starts, when I, when I say government, I also include large companies, because at some level in, in the West, I think they're almost interchangeable. So how do you interdict telecommunications? I mean, you know, they have to find some way to do it. So you go to another country and you buy a SIM card and they want to see your passport because they want to know who you are in case you say something so they can track you back again. Um, how do you interdict a, a website? 
Well, you, you, you create this thing called ICANN, and they force you to register your domain name. So if you say something really awful, they can, they, some lawyer has a way of suing you potentially. Uh, you know, intellectual property was originally this, you know, ridiculous regional DVD lockup thing. And now it's, uh, you know, they look to a reverse IP lookup. And if, if everybody here doesn't know how to use, you know, VPNs to get around that, I would be shocked. I mean, I spent half the time as I travel just using VPNs so I can watch HBO in Canada and, you know, Netflix. And, you know, I mean, it's like clearly, I mean, that's actually a really good example of how easy it is for modern technology to cause fear because we can easily use essentially just even mild encryption to circumvent government interdiction attempts. And that should be terrifying somebody because you couldn't do that 20 years ago. So imagine what you know, stronger encryption and good blockchain apps are gonna be able to do. And I think that creates a lot of opportunities. So fear, fear creates disruption and disruption creates opportunity. So some disruptive technologies on the horizon. Um, I'm sure you all know this, and there'll be other speakers talking about some of these in more detail, but I thought I'd kind of flesh a few of these out. Um, very strong consumer encryption. I'm a huge fan of this. Um, it, I, think it's, I think it's very important. In the US, we have a very a big dialogue on this right now, and I say dialogue in a very loose and a hypocritical sense, because we're not really talking about it, but it's, it's, it's the conflict between government surveillance and personal encryption. I'm very much on the side of personal encryption. Blockchain applications. I mean, being able to create a permanent record of a transaction, in my mind, is incredibly, uh, incredibly important to the future. And I could see where that's, uh, you know, especially when you have, you know, this term fake news, especially when you have this idea uh, of being able to tamper with events, I mean, that's, that's pretty disruptive. I mean, it's, it's about as anti-Orwellian as you can get, really, when you think about it. Because, you know, blockchain apps allow you to create immutable records of transactions, and I think that's important. Um, I've, I've personally uh, almost gone broke twice, three times now, trying to create startup companies that do persistent pseudonymous identities, which I think is uh, incredibly important to the world, but Apparently nobody else does because I never have gotten anywhere with it. But I just think that it's important for people to create, you know, lifetime identities that, that don't have the ability of retribution. Um, workable cryptocurrencies and unconstrained artificial intelligences, which I'm sure Trent will probably be referring to more. So blockchain opportunities. Well, I'll skip over this one. So here's, here's uh, just some things I, I think we should be thinking about. Um, that might be served by blockchain apps, universal pseudonymous IDs, uh, consumer-friendly encryption, I mean, really consumer-friendly that seamlessly integrates Tor, VPN, and encrypted emails. Uh, a lot of these are being done right now. Uh, universal secure healthcare records, I think that's a, a, a big one for blockchain, and I know people here are working on that. Borderless citizenship, I think Casper's gonna be talking more about what Estonia and other countries are doing. Blockchain-based contracts, IP registration, which of course was, you know, a scribe's beginning, and uh, just something I've always thought about, about AIs. I mean, as AIs start to develop, uh, you know, singularities start to occur, um, you know, I think it's going to be really interesting as we, we start making agreements with AIs, whether they're truly aware or not. Um, I can't even imagine that we're going to sign a contract with an AI. I think as people start making arrangements and agreements with AIs, and AIs make agreements with AIs, I think blockchain-based apps are how we will do that. Um, I think that's, a, that's a, a, a type of application from an AI to AI or person to AI would be a wonderful way of doing it. And uh, just leave you with one more last picture of woman strikes man. So thank you very much. Thanks, David. I think we have room for a few questions from the audience. Uh, is somebody around with us? Yeah, there is a microphone. So if you raise your hand, you get a mic and you can ask a question. If so, I have a question. Yeah, sure. Imagine with the technologies at hand now, uh -huh. would you, how would you re-architect the DNS? 
Uh, I would probably balkanize it, and I would create multiple DNSs so no single government had any control. And how would they sync up? Uh, they, they would sync up through agreement. I would have multiple root, root based systems instead of a single root. So there is a way out. Yeah, you could still do that today if you yeah. wanted to. Cool. Anyone from the audience? There's one. Based on your um, experience of the first dot-com bubble, um, if you could put a year on where we are now with blockchain in comparison to kind of um, the beginnings of the internet and so where we are in terms of um, deployment of technology and um, perhaps where we are in the life cycle and the point where we can get truly native blockchain apps, um, what year would we say we're in? I'd say you're in uh, early 1996 in the dot-com dot world. I'd say you're within 12 to 18 months of, uh, of a large-scale explosion, and you're about one and a half to two years away from large venture-funded applications. Thanks. Uh, thank you, David, for that presentation. Um, I just wanted your thoughts on what strikes me as paradox that mm -hmm. blockchain uh, and everything related to it is about sort of democratizing or decentralizing um, things that were traditionally done in institutional or jurisdictional boundaries, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and as you alluded to, in this world now, uh, where so many people access their information through social media, and therefore truth becomes actually a relative word because uh, people, and certainly I see this in my children, the younger generations, they rely more on what their friend circles say and they see what their friend circles um, uh, push to them as opposed to uh, listening to traditional news outlets and, and things like this. Mm -hmm. So this concept of having a uh, factual truth and whether it matters. I think we're seeing this play out in the US. Uh, actually, it doesn't really matter and people believe what they believe um, based on what their social network is telling them more so than what some authority is telling them. Right, that's what I was alluding to. Right, so you yeah. were alluding to that. So, um, so, and this is leading to greater social isolation because we're losing the ability to interact with each other as humans mm -hmm. at your your example with the llama is that's is why I was exactly saying that. it. Right. So, um, how do you how do you reconcile that paradox that I, technology is enabling all of this decentralization and universal IDs and all these great things, but individuals are not necessarily understanding that, and in fact, are going in the opposite direction. I, I I don't think I can. I think I was observing it, and I think that's why I led with that story. And it's, uh, I think we're forming a society where government is of less importance and individual is also of less importance. And I think our grouping, uh, not my generation, but I think new generations, the groups are gonna be uh, where they vet information. I, I, I think it's, it's, it's foreign to me, but I think that's what's gonna happen. So do you, do you think then that actually the world is leading towards more of a tribal nomadic yeah. kind I, of organizational actually, structure. That's why I did that, and I actually used that word. I, I think we're gonna see, I mean, when, I think we're gonna see a tribal information circle thing to where, where people will form uh, tribal uh, circles uh, early on in life, and I think they'll, they'll become like fraternities, or you know, people that go to Harvard have a tribe you know, that lasts for their whole life, and you know, people, people have tribes already. And, and, and these tribes are going to be how they, they network, how they connect, and how they believe what they read and what they read. I, I think that's already happening. I think it's going to become institutionalized. And I think elections are probably going to support that, at least in the West. And so how does an individual fight against that? Because there's so many um, influences on us that shape what we read, what we see, um, and so actually, as an individual who's interested in not being constrained and influenced by that, you have to spend a tremendous amount sure. of time actually just 
scanning a broad range of things, try to fool those algorithms that keep sending you the same stuff. I, I, uh, yeah, I spend a lot of time trying to beat it too. I, I think the best way is to experience. I mean, I've spent a lot, I, I took five, six years off and just travel the world and um, I experience things with my own eyes and it's very different uh, to me when I see things. I was just in China a couple of weeks ago and my view of China and Beijing with my eyes was very different than what I'd read. Yes. So I think personal experience, and, and I think it'd be nice to have blockchain apps to where you can do things like if you were at Tiananmen Square 15 years ago and you took video and then you shove it on the blockchain and then say, okay, screw you guys, you know, get rid of my video. I mean, I think that's what's important to be able to record events and to be able to see them, record them, put your own impressions, and then, then there's a, a record somewhere if anybody wants to look at it historically. Because there's always people who are curious enough to want to go to another source. I, I hope. Okay, thanks, David. I feel there is an exciting discussion coming up during the coffee. Please reach out to David uh, and give him a big applause.